Hi everyone, welcome back from lunch to this session. Our first speaker is Stefan Erb. He's working as a software engineer for Blue Yonder. He's also a member of the Apache Aurora project. And he will talk about complex systems and how to tame the Python in the torpid. Give a warm welcome to Stefan Erb. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, we don't want to start with complex systems directly today, but instead we want to have a look at what it looks like to work with something simple, or at least how it feels like. And I suppose many of you have seen this XKCD comic. Um, it's been, it has been around for quite some time. And it's kind of, yeah, I'll give you a second to read it for those of you that don't know it. Um, I feel like it expresses really well what it feels like to start programming in Python because um, you feel quite productive at the beginning. You, you, um, you can achieve quite, quite a few things with very little code. And even if you don't manage to do something on your own, you might find a dependency that you can use and you still get things done. And it really, really feels productive and you feel empowered. And that kind of boils down to this input and the gravity because you can't get so much done. But once you start working on a project for a longer period of time, that kind of that feeling goes away. So you don't feel that productive anymore. So for many people that work on projects for a longer period of time with more people, what they kind of want is they want to import Greenfield. So they want to start from scratch on a blank slate because they think, oh, we can undo all the mistakes we've made in the past and then everything will be fine. But kind of it's, the process is repeating over time. So, um, but what are we doing instead? We're working with, a complex, with something that's no longer Greenfield. And um, an engineer that works at Twitter kind of like, um, had, had a proposition for this, and he called this the axioms of engineering. And what he essentially said that most engineering time is spent debugging, and most of the time you're debugging, you're looking for information that you currently don't have. And most of the time you're looking for information, it takes you so long because you kind of you don't know the code or you're unfamiliar with the system itself. And um, from my experience, that feels true. And um, it's yeah, from my experience, it's just like that. And I have a few examples to kind of prove it. So think about you're currently um, working on some piece of code. So you're running it locally to test works, you check it in, and suddenly, snap, your kind of flow is broken because Jenkins doesn't want to run it, or maybe it runs it, but one test is failing. It's working locally, but it's not in Jenkins. And suddenly, you know, you're no longer creating features, adding value, but you're suddenly debugging, and it will take you quite some time to figure it out. Or another issue could be you finally manage to put it into production, and it's working. But suddenly some alerts go off because your service is meant to be slow, or the customer calls and says, yeah, that's unacceptable build because the services are slow. And again, you have to figure out what's going on because you're sure you didn't change your, your code. You're also sure that the environment around us, around you didn't change. And then you, you're again debugging and have to find out what did actually change. Um, that's kind of you walking through the three steps on the right. And um, that's and the difficult part is here that even if you think you're the one that's productive and you're not kind of slow down, you don't have to debug, um, most of us are working in a team. So if we look at team structures here, it could be you're the person in the top left corner. You're one guy and you're super productive writing code. But the other two team members in your team, they might now be the one that have to be debug because you wrote something they don't understand. And now you've act actively slowed them down by writing stuff they don't, can't handle. And it gets even worse if your team size increases because if you look at the second picture, you, we go from um, three people to four people, but the number of connections, the number of ways we can talk in the team doubles. And suddenly it's even more complicated to spread the knowledge of what we're doing to the rest of the team. And um, this kind of goes on and on with team size. So what, what we kind of want to do is we have to kind of spread the knowledge that we have or that, uh, the knowledge about a system to the whole team, because then all know what's going on and they will spend less time debugging and have more time to build features and to improve um, or kind of build, build your product. And if you look at what, what can normally be done to, to build understanding so that we can like, um, understand what we're actually doing, there are two main um, different areas that we, can, that we have at our disposal. The first one is kind of simple, the obvious one is this informal reasoning. This happens when you sit down, have a piece of code, and you read it. And you say, okay, that's a method, and I uh, get an argument in, and that argument may be true, and then this happens. That's kind of what we do when you read code. 
We may not do it that explicitly, but we do it implicitly in our head. And um, that's kind of, yeah, how we understand code most of the time when you write it. But we also do that when we are in code reviews or when we have a design review with our peers where the, we explain them how we want to design it or uh, where they explain us how they build it. And it also happens when we do pair programming, and there are a couple more techniques that all go into the direction how we understand code by looking at it from the inside. So we have the code or the system, and we kind of see all the inner workings, and then we try to figure out how it will behave as a whole. Um, that's kind of the working from the inner side, but there's also the second one, which is testing. And that's more about looking at our system as a black box and kind of doing something to it and see how it behaves. So we could have system tests and that use maybe a REST API, do some calls, and we'll see what com comes back. And by seeing what comes back, we kind of know, okay, it's behaving that, that kind of way. Uh, we cannot only do that the whole system, but also on sm smaller levels, so maybe on a component, or maybe even on a, un uh, on, a, on a class. So we have a unit test that tests the public method of the class. That's how we learn how, the, how it behaves, at least from the functionality um, point of view. Um, but that's kind of like just the first line. Um, there also, there's more stuff we can learn about a system, for example, how it behaves under load. Well, there might be many users, or we could get many requests. And that's also something we have to know in advance before we kind of put it into production. At least we should, because otherwise we don't really know how it will behave once we get many requests, because then it's the first time we see it break. And, um, and we have to spend that whole time debugging and learning while it's already running. We could do that beforehand. And the same applies to um, failures. So we could do something like case engineering to kill stuff randomly or on purpose and see how our system behaves if something crashes. And that's also all the stuff we can do in a black box fashion to figure out what's really going on. And there's an important distinction between those two, um, two ideas. If we write tests, we kind of find bugs in our code. Um, so that's kind of, we want that, because we want to find bugs if they're in there. But once we've got a decent coverage, once we are somehow certain that we know what's going on, um, we have to start working on the um, informal reasoning side, because we want actually to add less bugs to our code. If you have the perfect test suite, um, you still takes time for you to check in your code, and then let Jenkins complain to you that you broke something. And if we can find a way that we don't even make the mistakes in the first place, that will kind of give us a huge boost because we don't waste so much time waiting for errors to show up. And, um, but again, what those two have in common is that um, they get so much harder if our system is complex. So if um, my class has many members, many functions, I have to test all of them if I want to, sure, uh, want to understand what's going on. Same goes for reasoning. If I have lots of code that is a read-through, it just takes me longer to understand the system. And, um, so if something is complex, it's really difficult for me to understand it. But I need the understanding to change something with confidence. Because if, um, if I just have a couple hundred lines and I know I want to add a new feature, I'm pretty sure I know where to put them. But if I have tens of thousands of lines and I need to make a change and it's touching several places, how do I know that I've covered all of them if I don't understand my system fully? And that's how we get bugs into our code, because we missed something, or that's how we um, we add a security issue, or how we um, manage to um, break the estimate of our story, because we, during design estimation, we said, okay, it should take us two weeks, but we forgot something, and we just find it when implementing, and suddenly it takes four weeks, or even more. And that all comes from the root cause of complexity. Um, but what's kind of good for us software engineers is that's not something specific to software engineering. Um, it's kind of a widespread problem, and I have an example to hopefully prove it. And um, what you see here is the so-called door to hell. It's in Turkmenistan. Um, and what they wanted to do, they built a platform because they wanted to drill for uh, oil and gas, I guess, I believe. And um, what happened is that their platform collapsed. And suddenly they had kind of small gas leakage. And they decided, OK, that's unfortunate. Um, we just set it on fire because after a couple of days, a couple of weeks maybe, that should all be done. Then the whole gas is burned up we are safe. Um, but all that happened in 1971, and that hole has been burning for 40 years. And um, that's kind of what can happen if you have to make important decisions under stress, or under time pressure, if you don't have sufficient information to really understand what is going on there. And that's kind of the same problem we have, because we have tight deadlines, and you have to make a change, but you're not really sure uh, what the effect will be in the end. Um, 
And we now want to look at a few short Python code examples um, to kind of see how, how complicated it really is for us uh, when we're programming. And these are toy examples. So um, it's kind of like more meant to illustrate the point. So um, I'll give you a second to, to read it. So again, you have to do the mental reasoning, uh, ment uh, the informal reasoning thing. So you compile it in your head uh, or interpret it in your head and try to figure out uh, what's going on here. So um, first thing, what can happen? First scenario, that's kind of an easy one, right? Um, we give the thing a key and it has a lookup and structure called elements and it actually does it twice, it adds it. So what we actually get is we get two times the value that we stored in there. That's kind of like the normal happy path that we have. But um, it can also have be the case that the key isn't even in the structure. So we get a key error. So that's kind of the second path we have to keep in mind. But it gets more complicated and maybe some of you have some other error scenarios in mind. Um, one of them is that we return something completely else. Because we are not sure, when we just read the code, we are not sure yet if maybe another thread is changing the element structure simultaneously. So by just looking at that piece of code, we have no idea what's happening, what's coming out of there. Um, and that makes it so hard if you just see a random piece of code to figure out if it's doing the right thing or not. But we have to do it all the time when reading and writing code. And it even goes further. Um, for example, let's make a quick, um, quick question for the audience. Who thinks that this is a list and the key is an integer? Who thought that was what is first? Um, raise your hand if you feel that was your first thinking. Okay, couple, yeah. Who thought this is a dictionary and it's, okay, all right, okay. And now all of you, who thinks that this will crash when the network is down? Not that many, because um, it just looks like a dictionary list, but Python gives us so much, so much power that this could actually be, I don't know, memcached implemented that looks like the dictionary. And the guy who wrote it probably thought, oh yeah, it's a so oops, super awesome idea because I can use it wherever I want to use a dictionary. And that's, it's, it sounds so powerful, but if you end up reading the code, you really have to deal with that complexity. And um, this brings us to another problem, or it's like so-called law of leaky abstractions which mean that all abstractions we build and this, um, like, I don't know, key value store as a dictionary that does some remote thing over the network, that's exactly that kind of thing. Um, they look good in the first case and they're awesome in the happy path if everything is all right, but at some point in time it will leak out what's underneath. So they, we would get that if we get an exception um, because the network isn't working. Um, and what the law of leaky abstraction tells us that abstractions are fine, but because they help us building, we don't have to write so much code. But they don't um, solve us from learning about whatever is underneath. And um, so we still have to, I don't know, we have to know that we have a key value store that talks over the network. Um, because we need that to understand the thing. And uh, now we are talking about complexity that we understand, have to understand our whole system that kind of imply that abstractions don't really help us because we still have to understand everything. And it's the same for other um, abstractions like TCP. We think, okay, TCP is reliable. We can send one message or yeah, whatever from one side, computer to another, and TCP will ensure that it comes uh, out of the other side, same size, same order, nothing changed. Um, unless it doesn't, because if I cut the network cable, nothing will work. So always at some point stuff breaks. Or same with SQL. We say declaratively rewrite it, um, get the results back, but Maybe at one point in time, the database decides, oh, I will change the query plan, and suddenly it's slow. And we have different behavior, even though we didn't expect that. And so we have to kind of also learn about how does the database underneath work, and uh, maybe how do we have to write our query to make sure it's always the same thing that we want. And what makes this kind of, it doesn't make it worse, but it also applies to dependencies. In the beginning, I said it's awesome in Python because there's so much open source work that we can use. But again, there was most of the time provided some extractions, but we still have to learn about everything that's underneath. So if we use the library, we will really have to understand what it does and how it works and how it will break. And as an example, we'd look again at something simple. Um, 
This is a simple HTTP request. Um, so query JSON function, we give it a pass, and it does a call to an, a server, and um, gets whatever is behind there, but we can see we um, translate it to JSON, so it's probably JSON that we get. And we now want to do the same game of playing the different scenarios through. Um, there are many, I included just a few of them. Um, so the first one is again the good path. So we get the result. Um, we return the data as we expected it to be, so whatever's written there. But we're talking HTTP here using the request library. So it can happen that the server responds us with 500 internal server error, something like that. It might actually return a JSON, but if the status code tells us that this is invalid, we shouldn't use it. Um, it goes further. Maybe we aren't even able to um, establish the connection, so we might not even be able to make the HTTP request, but maybe the TCP network layer fails and we get an error right away. It can also be slow to connect, um, so you're seeing we're doing HTTPS here, and maybe our normal request takes like, I don't know, 20 milliseconds, but suddenly we add 100 milliseconds on top of it to do um, the SSL negotiation to encrypt all this stuff, and um, suddenly we are slow, and we kind of have to know that in advance when reading the code, but because there's a huge difference, do we call that message just once, or do we call it hundreds of times per second? There's a huge difference to how we have to write it and how we have to ensure it's working. And last but not least, it can also hang forever because we establish the connection, but maybe the server never sends us the response back. And we probably don't want to wait in that function forever until we continue once we get the result. And I now have an example how we have to kind of transform this into something that's more robust, that can actually be used in production or something close to it. And um, yeah, as you can directly see, it's much more code. I will try to explain it in the bottom-up fashion. Um, so at the top, we again have a query JSON function. And um, the first thing you see, we respond to JSON, we return that, that's all right, same before. But now we edit race for status in the um, second last line. This is a built-in mechanism a request that checks the HTTP status code and just throws an exception if nothing is wrong. So we got that covered. Um, the line above, we see we added a timeout. So that's for us to ensure that we don't wait forever, but we say, okay, up to 10 seconds, I don't want to wait any longer because normally my request takes, I don't know, 100 milliseconds. If it goes on for 10 seconds, I'm pretty sure that something's completely wrong and um, I don't want to wait any longer. Um, but now we actually got another problem because um, what happens if the server is down? If the server doesn't respond or always runs into the, t or lets the server already runs into the timeout, suddenly, my um, query JSON function will always take exactly 10 seconds. I call it server blocks, after 10 seconds get, I get the exception. I mean, I have to care, uh, care about the exception wherever I call that, but now I have the difference that my, it's always slow, always 10 seconds, rather 100 milliseconds. And now it's not only that the other server is failing, but now my service is in jeopardy as well, because probably my users don't want to wait 10 seconds for each request. So we also have, a, had, have to add a workaround for that. And this is where circuit breakers come into play. It's kind of like the same we have in the physical world that ensure you don't die if you throw your toaster into the bus, bus tube. Um, so what, what's happening here, we added a decorator, this API breaker. And um, it's actually defined above as a circuit breaker. And what we say is if the uh, method we've annotated fails five times in a row, it should fail immediately if we call it the second time. So instead of going to the 10 second delay, it just fails immediately. And, um, it doesn't really matter how often we call it, it just aborts immediately, we get an exception, we have to handle that outside of it, but, um, but now we are fast again. And we can tell our users that, okay, this doesn't work, but we can tell it after a couple milliseconds rather than 10 seconds. And um, it also has a reset timeout, so after 60 seconds, we just try it one more time. And if it's not working, the circuit is open again. If it's still failing, we test again after, and again, 60 seconds. Okay, so we at least now get that covered. But we still have to figure out is this actually the problem? So once our service is slow in production, is that a problem for us? So we have to even add another thing, which is instrumentation, to figure out how long do our requests take. And we use Prometheus for that. There was also a talk about this yesterday. Um, so we can add um, an annotation request time, and this will now add, um, expose some counters that we can use and plot in an uh, um, external system to really figure out, is this request going slower than it used to be last week, uh, or maybe yesterday? And um, that's kind of just showing 
what's all going on here that we have to keep in mind. Um, and that's it's kind, kind of like all we wanted to do was to make a simple HTTP request. But if you really want to use it, you have all that accidental complexity around, um, and we have to read it and understand it, and that's kind of that's difficult. Unfortunately, that's not the only stuff we have to worry about. And I have an example from my colleague Sebastian, um, which kind of goes also to another direction of sources of complexity in our code. And this is state. And um, this probably could be a talk on its own, but I will just focus on one particular thing, which is here um, you have those matches or sticks. And um, your task is to go from the left side to the right side. As a human, you would go ahead and just remove that one stick, because that's simple. Um, and we could probably also implement it that way by kind of like um, implementing all the different transitions from one to the other. Um, but as a machine, we also have another possibility, which is we just wipe it completely clean, and um, instead of moving from the eight to the nine, we go from the empty slate to directly to the nine. And um, there's a huge difference in complexity in here, because for the mutable one, we have like 45 combinations that we all have to deal with. If we directly go to the correct one, it's just 10. So um, that's in all, kind of a real creative improvement for us, because once we have to read the code, we would have to check all of them. But now it's um, significantly less that we have to care about. And um, that's. There, I mean, there are more cases with state that we have to be careful with. Um, there are other parts, but it's, um, it gets complicated really quickly, especially in Python, because it's not that built for immutability. Uh, but still, we can make small decisions that help us to write better code, for example, or at least code that's a bit easier to understand. Because when we see something and it's immutable, we, don't know, we know it won't change. Because if we have, um, for example, we're using a, um, using a tuple or a named tuple. We know that can't change. If you pass around a dictionary, when you see it, you have to keep in mind someone might change it simultaneously, for example. Um, you don't have to care about that if we use immutable data structures. Um, they come with some problems, though. Um, but at least it helps us from, with the informal reasoning that we kind of want to care about today. Um, but the, uh, what, what's interesting with state is you often get it for other reasons. So even if you say we implement it that way, um, so we, we, we do what Sebastian proposed and kind of wipe it clean, set it up that way, um, it could be the case that we have a problem when we do that, that it gets slow. Because maybe we have not just those uh, nine to 10 metrics that we make, but maybe some much bigger problem. And this is kind of the area of performance and performance tuning. Um, this is where lots of complexity in code comes from because people make um, improvement with the code to run in the needed time frame. And this is kind of, kind of where we could mess up and introduce complexity. And what I want to kind of like um, introduce here is a couple of, um, yeah, kind, of, kind of an advice from a book from John Bentley. It's called Programming Pearls. And in that book, he talks about different aspects of programming. And in one particular section, he talks about um, performance tuning. And he essentially mentioned that when we solve a problem, we have different layers that we operate at. We have the problem's definition, so what's the problem we're supposed to solve? Maybe the story we get. Then we have the system structure, how our system looks like, the architecture. We have the algorithms and the data structures we use within the code directly. Then we have some tuning below that we can do. Maybe make sure we don't have too many, um, too many assignments or um, ensure that we don't touch too much or whatever. Um, then we have system software below and finally hardware. And um, what his argument is, if you want to make sure something is faster, you kind of have to pick a good level to improve it. So if you want to make something a little bit faster, you pick a few levels here and you make that uh, improvement on that level and then you're done. But if you want to make something really, really fast, you have to work on all of them. And we've seen it yesterday, for example, uh, with the talk on this um, FPGA accelerated database, they kind of had to go down to the hardware, even to the hardware level, to get the, get the performance out of it. Um, we can do that, but kind of like, I believe that Python is more, it's better at the above layers. So let's say you read a new machine learning paper and you think, oh, that sounds cool. 
and could solve the problem for me. Because we are, Py we are in Python, it's not that difficult to write Python code. We could actually have a chance to implement a new algorithm and kind of improve our whole um, our model, our machine learning model. Um, same applies if we say, okay, we have to move to from um, like a monolith to a microservice architecture. If you're in Haskell, that could be a little bit more complicated. I don't know. But in Python, we kind of have a certain kind of flexibility, and we should use it. And the same applies for the problem definition. And that's probably the biggest advantage we have. Can we change the problem in a way that becomes simpler? For example, when, again, machine learning, do you have to train on all data to get the predictions? Or can I just train on a fraction of it and get the same result? Suddenly, everything's easier. And there are different cases where this applies. But still, what what one sees commonly is that um, in Python, Python, the interpreter is not that fast, at least for stuff some people want to do. So we drop down to the code tuning and system software stuff. Um, for example, we might rewrite some of our code in Python. Or we might think it's a good idea to um, even go ahead and write C++ code. It's, and if you just look at the problem at hand that you have, you think it's a good idea because how do you make it so much faster? faster. But you have to consider what's happening in the whole organization, and that's kind of a ripple effect. Because you think I implement my algorithm in C++, and at the first sight, that's cool, it works. But the downside is now all your developers have to use the GCC or another kind of compiler on the system. And um, kind of all of them needed to build your software. Um, and you then might adopt something like, I don't know, Vagrant or Docker to run it, also fine. Because they say, okay, I also need to push it to production. And I, of course, don't want to compile in production, but maybe have different versions, uh, different systems, or maybe have to compile different uh, multiple times. I say, oh, I don't want to do that. I also use Docker in production. Then you're um, running Docker in production, but you notice mm, it's kind of flaky um, because it's using the latest kernel features. So I have to upgrade my kernel so that it works reliable. And um, you do that, and then there's the latest OpenSSL issue, and you have to patch. OpenSSL, but suddenly you don't have a couple of servers to patch, but tens of thousands of Docker images. And that's like one decision to make your machine learning model a little bit faster could kind of ripple through the whole organization and cause kind of complexity and pain for everyone. And um, that's, it may, it's, it's very difficult to make that decision if that's at one point in time really correct to do that kind of assumption or um, thing. But um, it, it's still a valid thing to make, and you have to make it as a conscious decision that we wanted, or that you wanted. Um, I think many people will go down that route and say, okay, we need to run Python with something in C, um, but you have to be aware of what you could lose. Um, and so we've kind of now seen quite, we've seen very simple Python code snippets. But still, when we think it through, it's, in the end, it's completely complex. We have to keep so many cases in mind, and. Um, not just from our team, but also from other teams and out of the team members. Um, and the thing here is that the complexity we add, it adds more complexity over time. Because um, maybe I've, um, we have a story, and the story has to finish in two weeks. For whatever reason, we have a deadline. Maybe self-imposed, maybe from a customer, but we have to do it that way. And um, you're kind of late, and suddenly you hit a problem. And um, you hit the problem, and you have to make a workaround to make it work. And you leave that workaround in the code. But now you've kind of um, left a landmine that the next team, or even you in the future, might step on. And suddenly it blows up, and you have the same problem again. You have to make a workaround to make it in time. That's kind of creeping up over time. So, and it's not just over time, but it's also just with lines of code. Because as we've seen in the other examples, super simple Python code can lead to problems over time. And, um, if we think that through, the only thing that we can really do is we have to cut code. So we have to make sure we don't have that much code. And um, I believe many Germans are in the audience, so they can relate to that. Um, we, we have to build more with less. So we have to be kind of like more like modern talking in the sense that um, they have eight cords and but sold one and one and 20 million records. And it's it's hard to say, but we kind of have to try to do something similar, right? Do something simple, but try to achieve lots with it. And, um, and unfortunately, that's pretty difficult, difficult because what we want to do is we kind of still want to provide something valuable, but we still want to 
cut some stuff that we don't want to maintain because it's causing complexity and complexity ramps up over time. And um, so it boils, out, boils down to how can we remove features. And um, that's actually quite a difficult question. Um, I don't have a perfect answer for that, but um, I have at least something that I believe can be valuable in doing that. And um, there's a paper from the 80s. It's called The End-to-End -End Argument in System Design. And uh, what, it, what it tells us is if you have a layered system, um, you should always try to push um, the thing you write or the, log the, the, the logic to your application so that it's closer to the application that uses it rather than doing it in the lower level. And the paper explains this quite, uh, quite good. Um, I will instead try to explain to you with an example because I believe that's more approachable. So what we want to do is we want to send a file over the network from one side to the other. Uh, we've learned in the, uh, before that TCP is kind of providing reliability, but I also mentioned it's a leaky abstraction. But even if we assume TCP is perfect, it can totally happen that we get something wrong at the other end. Because we have a file on our side, and we read it from disk, and while reading from disk, it might not be the same data we get than we wrote a couple of weeks ago because maybe there's a corruption in the disk itself, or maybe there's a bug in the storage driver, or while we put the data in our cache, there's like a bit flip. That could all happen, and that could all lead to that we send something wrong. But even if we send the correct thing, the other side might uh, have the same issue, and the data changes. But if we now kind of like pick up this end-to-end -end thinking, we could say, okay, how can I solve the problem end-to-end? -end? And um, how can I assure that what I send is actually what the other side receives? So we have to kind of, one solution to do that is that you attach a checksum to the data you send. Or even simpler, you use a gzip file um, because it just has a checksum in it. And right now, when we do that, we kind of don't really care any, at least not that much any longer what's happening in between because um, we could probably now even use UDP to send our file to the other side and just retry if it didn't work. We don't have to rely on all the stuff in between. And in particular, I mean, we might still need it for performance reasons because we don't want to send the whole file all the time, but we don't have to rely on it. That's, um, pretty, uh, that's kind of a perfect solution for it. And um, this kind of allows us to, and we kind of like kind of try to take that idea and like try to also remove code in our cases. Because in that other case, we could maybe remove some of the um, retry logic and stuff within the TCP network layer. I mean, if, we, if you would have to write from scratch, well, luckily we don't have to, but we can now try to apply the idea to whatever we are doing. So for example, uh, think about you're responsible to write a machine learning model. And you're now responsible to kind of like um, for the, the whole thing. And think, okay, I adopt maybe a new algorithm, maybe I've implemented in C++, whatever, because I need the perfect prediction quality for it. Um, but if you now think the problem end to end, you have to also look how is my prediction used. Maybe the prediction is used to order something, but you can only order something in larger quantities. I don't know, like truck sizes. So it doesn't matter if you're better with like um, two pieces or four pieces accuracy if you have always ordered a truck. So if we think the problem end to end, maybe you find a way to, oh, prediction quality is not that important just needs to be okay-ish, and then we can still solve the problem, but we might come away with a simple algorithm. Um, or other cases, if you're doing operations, you might have to um, cover the cases where um, your service has failures. But at one point in time, if you think it end-to-end, -end, at one point in time you can stop. You think, I don't have to care about more reliability, because what the end user has, and like for the DSL connections to your service, that's not that reliable either. And uh, they will always be the case where they just hit F5 in the browser, so end to end, they hit F5, reload the page, and all right. So it's okay that we can sometimes make decisions to say, okay, we don't want to do that, and uh, we try to make it simpler. And um, I'm sure that some of you can come up with more cases, and if you look around, you will actually see other applications of this idea. For example, there's a Google security white paper, and in that they explain that they kind of like want to get rid of network security and push all their security stuff within their applications directly so that even if you work at Google, you don't really have to use a VPN to connect to the site because the site doesn't really rely on VPN to ensure that you are the correct guy. But they do it end-to-end um, -end from your computer 
that you're authenticated with directly to the service, and you, they don't need a network underneath, and it's a kind of the same idea. You can push logic into the applications and thereby reduce some complexity for the layers in between. Because you have to do it for the ends anyway. Just relying on the network, for example, isn't, isn't sufficient. Um, and there are other cases. You can probably look into it, so I would recommend that you look into the paper. It's a bit old, but um, I will sure that you get some ideas how to do it. Um, so last but not least, short summary what we've seen. So we've seen that most engineering time that we, or most time that we spend in the engineers debugging. And we spend so much time because we don't really understand the system. Um, and it's hard to understand our systems because they tend to be complex. Maybe because they have lots of logic or just much code. And um, because code is, a responsible, is so responsible for that, we have to cut code. So we have to, um, sorry, um, more code means, means more complexity. So the more code we have, the higher chance that our whole system is complex. Um, so we have to be like a little bit like modern talking, try to do more with less, so with less code. And um, to do that, we could try to use the end-to-end -end argument to actually um, throw some features out. And um, my kind of action item for you is just try it. So please go home, try to deprecate some features that you don't like or think they're not valuable because nobody can not really use it or still has to build something around it. Um, just try it, throw some code, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your talk. It was uh, very, very informative. Um, I don't have really a question, but more a remark. And um, I fully agree, just throw away code. But please, while you do, still uh, keep like the doc strings up. Because yeah. most of your um, things you've shown in, in the beginning with your, all the examples could have been solved if you have a proper documentation yeah. of what you expect. And also if you document like your error cases, like what goes wrong and how it can go wrong. And then you have a, like an actual chance. Of, of uh, fixing this and understanding your bug or yeah. problem. Yeah, it's even like, um, I totally agree, and it's um, also the type annotations. There were two talks yesterday that mentioned them. That would also help in these problems, because suddenly you could see, oh, I actually have a key value, I don't know, memcached rather than normal dictionary. So I totally agree there. It's always kind of a balance, because you don't want to add too much documentation, but that's general um, thing, but yeah, I agree. Are you doing any static code analysis to uh, assess the complexity of your, of your stuff? Not really. Um, we probably should. I mean, it's kind of depend on what you want to do with it. So um, right now, um, we're not doing it. At least I'm not aware of it. Um, the, but we kind of like when you think about in general, what you really want is when you have a chance to find errors early, you want to do that. So if you have static code checks, at least they tell you something is wrong. Exactly. If you find it, we should all run it. We should all run them because, um, like again, with t static type checks, a way I can find an error without writing a test case for it, I should really do that. Um, if you think about just this analysis, the question is always how do you make it actionable? Because um, I believe many of you have probably seen that you end uh, at some test for PEP8 that warns about code violations. I don't know line lengths too long or so. But you do look at it in the beginning, but after a couple of weeks, you just ignore it and it just goes up. So those things, in my experience, just tend to work if you say, I have zero way of violations. So I, when I want, I don't know, adopt PEP8 or Flake8 or so for my code checks, I really have to make sure that it's always zero and I can't really make commit um, if I violate that. And if you do something well, like with the code complexity, that could probably work. But I believe it's sometimes complicated if you just like, okay, this, I don't know, this function has too many if clauses. But maybe it's at six, and you have to fix the bug, and suddenly it's eight. And it's like now stopping you to fix the bug, um, even though you kind of really want to change it now. And that's kind of difficult, because then, then people want to tweak the thresholds. Um, yeah. Did that answer your question, or did I get it wrong? It's sort of. but. I mean, you can you, you can you can get metrics on a code base to get the overall uh, feel for the complexity, which is exposing something you, that you won't necessarily intuitively see. Yeah. So it's, it, there, there is all kinds of static code analysis, but there are tools that will that, that specialize on uh, assessing the complexity. 
Yeah, I think I should I have to look into that more, but um, we can chat afterwards, maybe if you have some experience with that. Um. More questions or comments? One more uh, remark on the, on the complexity. Uh, what's uh, absolutely efficient is actually like uh, sticking to the 80 uh, so characters of PEP8 because um, if you have like a sixth or seventh level uh, thing, then your tabs are so, or your, your code that you can actually write before you violate your 80 signs is so small and it's so really annoying to find variable names that are so short and still readable that you try like automatically remove complexity from your code. Mm -hmm. So that's also like, uh, it worked quite, quite well for me just because it triggers myself to just keep it simple, you know, and try to get out of the loops. That's a good idea, I never thought of that that way. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so let's all thank Stefan Erb again for his nice talk. Thank you.